A few years ago, a bodybuilder friend of mine from the gym told me it's really important that I do squats, deadlifts, and other heavy compound exercises because they boost testosterone more than lightweight movements or machine exercises. And it turns out, in a way, he was right. It's long been established that resistance exercise increases serum concentrations of hormones like testosterone, growth hormone, and IGF-1. And foundational research from the 1990s and early 2000s led by Dr. Bill Kramer showed that the higher the training intensity, so training with heavier loads, and the more muscle mass involved in the exercise, so training with compound movements, for example, the more testosterone increase you see. And the reasoning from there was fairly straightforward. Since we know that testosterone is anabolic, aiming to increase it acutely should be weighted pretty heavily when it comes to designing an effective hypertrophy-focused training program. And naturally, I went on believing for several years that the reason why this style of training was so effective for me was that it was jacking up my testosterone. It wasn't until later that I realized that the level of testosterone increase seen with these training modifications just isn't enough to increase muscle growth on its own, and that this heavy compound strategy is most likely effective for a different reason. It induces progressive tension overload and activates a large volume of musculature, with the modest testosterone increase being a mere side effect, so to speak. And this is the more consensus view in the current scientific literature, as more recent data from West and colleagues out of McMaster University concluded that post-exercise increases in these hormones cannot be used as proxy markers for hypertrophic potential in human skeletal muscle. And if you just look at some of their data, it's clear that despite the fact that testosterone did increase with a training protocol that emphasized high intensity and large muscle masses, there was no difference in muscle protein synthesis between the groups. And just keep in mind that the increases in testosterone were acute, meaning they didn't get elevated from the training and stay elevated, they simply spiked up and then came back down after an hour, which seems almost definitely not enough of a chronic hormonal shift to do much for muscle growth. So reading this made me curious how much of an increase you'd need to see gains from it. So let's talk some numbers. According to a 2017 paper, a harmonized normal range for healthy, non-obese American and European men aged 19 to 39 years old is 264 to 916 nanograms per deciliter. And it's not clear if increasing testosterone naturally within this range will do much in the way of increasing muscle mass. However, we do know that increasing it through exogenous testosterone supplementation does increase muscle mass. In fact, it might increase muscle mass better than training alone does. A landmark 1996 paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine split 40 men into one of four groups. Group one trained naturally. Group two took 600 milligrams of testosterone every week and weight trained. Group three took 600 milligrams of testosterone every week but did not weight train. And group four was the placebo group. They didn't train or inject testosterone. The training program was a little weird, just four sets of six reps on the squat and bench press three times a week for 10 weeks. But some of the results were pretty shocking. The group that injected testosterone and trained saw, unsurprisingly, the most gains, and the placebo group saw, unsurprisingly, the worst gains. However, what may surprise some people is that injecting 600 milligrams of testosterone per week led to a greater increase in muscle mass without any resistance training than resistance training naturally did. Of course, if more of an optimized training routine were provided, the results may have favored the trained and natural group more. However, based on this study alone, what we can say is that testosterone really works. However, just look at the scale of increase we're talking about here. At baseline, the concentrations were just around 500, and after 10 weeks of weekly injections, they were up around 3,000 nanograms per deciliter. That's an enormous increase, magnitudes greater than the acute changes you see from altering training methods, which only last acutely anyway. But what I really wanted to know was, would going from 600 to, say, 800 make any difference? Or better still, would altering these levels anywhere within the natural, normal, physiological range help me get more jacked? And after scouring the literature on this, the best answer I can give is maybe. It seems really likely that increasing a low testosterone level of, say, around 300 nanograms per deciliter or lower to a more average level, like, say, 600 nanograms per deciliter, might help. Boston and colleagues were able to show that even in the absence of weight training, increasing testosterone levels from 306 to 570 nanograms per deciliter across 20 weeks led to a pretty big increase in fat-free mass, as measured by hydrostatic weighing and DEXA, of about 3 kilograms, or about 6.5 pounds. So going from a hypogonadic level of 300 or less to a more normal range would almost certainly help. However, it's unclear whether or not going from a more middle of normal range to a more high end of normal range would do much. So since we've already debunked the idea that acute increases around the training session does much of anything, the next thing I wanted to figure out was if there are other ways I could increase my testosterone naturally. And since we're on the topic of training, it does seem that overtraining is a bad idea. To give you some idea, overtraining in the literature has been defined as any increase in training volume and or intensity resulting in long-term performance detriments. 
And it turns out that if you overdo it too much for too long, testosterone drops off. And overdoing training volume is worse for testosterone than overdoing training intensity. A study by Fry et al. showed that doing 10 one rep max squats every day for two weeks didn't change testosterone concentrations. However, multiple studies have found that large increases in volume reduces testosterone. And such is the case when combining weight training with endurance training. According to the most recent work by Jones et al., it seems that combining strength and endurance training in the same session, three days per week for six weeks, doesn't significantly decrease testosterone compared to strength training alone. However, this is in contrast to earlier research that did report a testosterone decrease when combining combining weights and cardio. So it seems that if you're simply doing too much training volume when combining the two, then physiological stress will increase to a point past which endocrine changes favor catabolism, namely a dip in testosterone and a spike in cortisol. So to reduce this effect, try to stick to lower intensity cardio performed at a low to moderate frequency with shorter durations as much as you can, assuming your primary goal is muscle and strength gain. So what about diet? Isn't soy really bad for testosterone levels? Not really. The most comprehensive meta-analysis on this topic, which analyzed 32 studies, came to the general conclusion that neither soy foods nor isoflavone supplements alter measures of bioavailable testosterone concentrations in men. For something more tangible, examine.com states that one to two servings of soy food daily and less than 25 grams of soy protein from non-concentrate sources doesn't impact testosterone and only seems to adversely affect testosterone when superloaded. And soy protein concentrate, even when highly consumed, probably doesn't affect testosterone because of its negligible isoflavone content, which are the compounds in soy that bind to the estrogen receptors to begin with. But more to the point, it seems that the main dietary factors driving changes in testosterone are body composition and caloric intake. In a 12-month case study following a natural bodybuilder during contest prep, it was found that as his caloric intake went from 4,750 calories to 2,100 calories per day, taking his body fat from 14.8 to just 4.5%, his testosterone plummeted from 991 nanograms per deciliter to just 227 nanograms per deciliter. That's a 77% decrease. Rapid weight loss can also decrease testosterone. A 2008 study on competitive wrestlers found that just two to three weeks of caloric deficit caused a pretty huge 62% decrease in testosterone when caloric intake was limited to 500 to 1,000 calories per day. On the flip side, since overweight individuals tend to have lower testosterone and chronic overfeeding has been shown to reduce testosterone, there seems to be a sweet spot in terms of body fatness and caloric intake that will be specific to the individual. But by my estimation, sitting somewhere between 10 to 15 percent body fat will be a healthy spot to optimize testosterone levels for most men. The macronutrient composition of the diet also seems to matter, with high-fat diets generally outperforming low-fat diets. However, it seems that total energy intake is likely the main driver of these changes, and I personally think that as long as your fats are somewhere in the normal range of, say, 20 to 40 percent of caloric intake, testosterone levels can be optimized. There's also a slight trend towards saturated fat increasing testosterone more than other fats, so including some saturated fat and sufficient fat generally may help in optimizing testosterone. However, keep in mind that the magnitude of these changes are relatively small, with one study showing a low-fat diet to reduce testosterone by 12% in older men, and another study showing a higher-fat diet to increase testosterone by 13% in young men. The vitamin and mineral composition of the diet also matters, but more so in the case of deficiencies. For example, a zinc deficiency can lower testosterone, so be sure to eat plenty of foods rich in zinc, like meat, shellfish, beans, and certain nuts. Vitamin D can also regulate testosterone levels, so depending on how much sun exposure you get, supplementation of up to 3,000 IU per day can increase testosterone. There are other supplements that generally have weak evidence supporting them, such as D-aspartic acid, but it only seems to work for 6 to 12 days before levels just go back to normal, and it isn't associated with any body composition changes. Ashwagandha has one study showing a 15% testosterone increase in young healthy men, but the evidence is otherwise non-existent. Other supplements like tribulus, horny goat weed, and fenugreek have no evidence, no human evidence, and conflicting evidence respectively. For these reasons, I wouldn't focus on natural supplementation for boosting testosterone. So what about lifestyle factors like sleep, stress, and sex? While the correlation is not as strong as I would have expected, decreased sleep has been associated with decreased testosterone. While one 2011 study found that reducing sleep from eight hours to five hours per night for five days reduced testosterone by 10.4% in young men, a later 2012 study found that reducing sleep from 10 hours to four hours for five days noted only a trend for reduced testosterone that didn't reach statistical significance. On the other hand, sleep deprivation for 33 hours straight resulted in a 27% average drop in testosterone in 24 young men. 
Sexual activity seems to play an important role in testosterone regulation. One study published in the Journal of Evolution and Human Behavior showed that simply having a five-minute conversation with an attractive woman was able to boost testosterone by 30% in men. Other research has shown that sexual arousal from viewing pornographic films can increase testosterone secretion in men, with one study showing that watching a four-minute erotic video clip before training significantly improved three-rep max strength on the squat. The quote, freshness of one's relationship also seems to matter, with a 2015 paper showing that single men and men in a new relationship, which was defined as lasting less than 12 months, had significantly higher testosterone than men in long-term relationships. And other earlier research showed that both men and women with polyamorous relationships, or who have multiple committed relationships, have higher testosterone than single folks, with singly partnered individuals having the lowest testosterone of all. Of course, it's important to keep in mind before you dump your main squeeze or pick up a new one that we're simply looking at correlations. It seems to me that it could be the case that men and women with higher testosterone are just more likely to want or to be in multiple relationships, not necessarily that having multiple partners increases testosterone, while that remains a strong possibility. Given the variety and lifestyle preferences on this front, perhaps the most generalizable advice is to have regular sex, since testosterone increases after evening coitus in both men and women, while on evenings with no intercourse, testosterone decreases as the night goes by. And for the record, ejaculation by itself isn't associated with changes in testosterone, since the actual ejaculatory process is regulated by serotonin and nitric oxide, not testosterone. Other things worth mentioning that can optimize testosterone levels include de-stressing as much as possible, such as by meditating and relaxing, and avoiding excessive alcohol intake, which has been shown to reduce testosterone. And so, while barring exogenous hormonal supplementation, all of these methods may not be enough to drastically improve your gains on their own, perhaps combining several of the actions discussed could make a significant enough impact on your gym performance and physique to make it worthwhile. All right, what is going on everyone? Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching the video. I put a lot of energy into creating this one in a way that was not only information packed, but also hopefully entertaining to watch. And I wanna give a quick shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. In case you guys aren't aware, Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform that allows you to custom create your own website. Uh, it's easy to use with beautiful designer templates and 24-7 award-winning customer service. And I'm really excited about this partnership because I've personally been using Squarespace for two years uh, to run my own website and my own online coaching business. Uh, so if you guys would like to get started with your free trial in building your own website or setting up your own online store, you can do so today at squarespace.com by using the offer code NIPPERD, which will save you 10% off your first purchase. And I also want to give a huge shout out to you guys and thank you for your continued support. That's because of your guys' support that I'm able to have the opportunity to work with companies like Squarespace. So once again, thanks for watching the video. Uh, leave it a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next one.